What's up everybody? This is my video on direct mail marketing. So if you want to use direct mail marketing, if you're a wholesaler, if you're a rehabber, if you want, if you're short-term rental, Airbnb Verbo host, if you're a long-term buy and hold investor and you want to utilize direct mail to expand your portfolio, this video is for you. All right, so all about direct mail, all about how to use direct mail. If you're a wholesaler, rehabber, buy and hold investor, um, you know, the type of strategy that you utilize will depend on your business model. If you're a wholesaler, rehabber, you're also your buy box, what your criteria is, what kind of houses you're looking to buy. The thing that we're gonna talk about is the list. So what you can do is there's multiple data sources that I'm gonna to give to you that can aggregate this data and give you a list of properties based on your criteria. Uh, that's going to have a big effect on the type of campaign that you can put together. Uh, we're gonna talk about that. We're also gonna talk about skip tracing, what skip tracing is, different types of pieces, different types of media that you can use in your direct mail campaigns. Also the frequency with which you have to send these uh, pieces out and the expectations that you need to have budget, to see how much budget do you reasonably need to be successful in direct mail and also the tools that you can utilize to uh, pull the data, to send out the uh, direct mail pieces, whether it's letters, lists, um, postcards. And Kennedy, he is a copywriter. Um, he came out with a book where he, he mentioned three things, message, market, and media. That's pretty easy to remember because they start with M's, but M is the sales copy that's on your direct uh, mail pieces. The market is really, for our purposes, is where you're sending the pieces. So you're gonna pull a list based on bedrooms, baths, age, size, square footage, also motivation factors, uh, divorced, um, vacant houses, absentee landlords. Those are really, that's what we, what I'm referring to when I say market. The, also the media is, are you sending out postcards, yellow letters, uh, fake checks, um, handwritten letters, uh, handwritten letters written by robot. These are all the different types of media that you can use. So heard me talk about a marketing funnel, building a marketing funnel, the whole purpose of the marketing funnel is you are sending out mail, in this case, direct mail, people are calling you, you're generating leads, and then you're filtering that, out those leads, and at the bottom should be coming deals, contracts. Uh, that's really what we're trying to do. So when we say direct, any type of direct marketing, meanings, it means that you're not doing any type of branding. What you're doing is you're sending out uh, marketing messages for the purposes of a direct response. So the purpose of the marketing campaign is direct response. So we're not dealing with branding or anything like that. We're not talking about uh, Coca-Cola commercials, Pepsi commercials, that's not what we're doing here. We're sending direct mail pieces directly to homeowners that own homes in the based on the criteria that we're gonna use to buy these houses. So that, but what are the strengths and the weaknesses, the pros and the cons of using direct mail? Well. The, probably the biggest strength of direct mail is that you can actually target the types of houses that you want to buy. So one of the advantages that direct mail has over things like websites, paid search, SEO, is that you can pull lists of properties and only send pieces to houses based on your buy box, your purchase criteria with uh, search engine optimization and websites and PPC, you're, it's based on what they type in, the search queries that they type in. They may or may not have a house that fits your criteria. So that's one of the advantages of direct mail over some of the other forms of marketing. of direct mail marketing. It's considered what I call interruptive marketing, where you're interrupting somebody with a direct mail piece or a marketing piece that they didn't solicit. Therefore, your conversion rates will be lower. So your conversion rates are going to be lower than, let's say, um, you know, your, your other inbound sources. So I consider direct mail outbound as a traditional form of marketing. If you're curious as to what those terms mean, I'll put a link in the description below on what uh, I mean by inbound versus outbound, traditional versus digital. I think those are very important terms, but I have other videos explaining that. Um, the other thing about direct mail, it can be a little tricky to uh, measure your response rate based on the amount of pieces that come out, based on the amount of pieces that bounce back. Um, there are tools that you can leverage to measure the amount of inbound calls that you get. For example, call rail. I tell everybody, measure your marketing. You have to measure your marketing. Keep a, uh, I keep a spreadsheet of all leads that come in to my business based on marketing channel because I like to review those quarterly and yearly. So it's very important that you track your marketing. Um, the other thing about direct mail is that it's we in at the carrot school of thought we consider this hamster wheel marketing where you kind of have to it's effort driven where you keep having to do stuff. 
uh, to actually get the phone to ring and get these leads coming in. So I consider that a little bit more towards the hamster wheel side. Um, it's also, there's a very important concept of pay per impression. So you have to pay to send somebody your ad and whether or not they actually see the ad is out of your control. So pay per impression means you actually pay to display an ad to them. Other examples of pay per impression are billboards, um, TV ads, Facebook ads, search and dis display ads mainly. Um, now, the difference between a paper impression model and a paper click model is with a paper click model, like Google PPC, is you're only paying when somebody clicks on your ad. Somebody actually engages with your advertisement. Now, with direct mail, you can send out, let's say, a thousand postcards. You have to pay before you send them out. You're paying. A lot of times you'll get what's called bounces. We're going to talk about that a little bit, a little bit further uh, out in the video. But uh, if only 800 people actually look at your your, your ad that you send them, whether it's your postcard or your letter, you're still paying for those thousand pieces. So that's one of the disadvantages of direct mail marketing. Um, you can use direct mail in conjunction with digital platforms. I use direct mail to uh, advertise my website. I always put my website on all my direct mail pieces. That's an opportunity. The thing, one, another opportunity with direct mail is when you start pulling lists, you can do what's called list stacking. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in detail, but basically what you do is you have your buy box, your search criteria, you can stack multiple motivation signals together, meaning if they have, if they're out of state, it's vacant and they haven't paid utilities or they filed for bankruptcy, that's multiple distress signals. What you can do is compile all this data in something like Excel. And if this one property, this one property record shows up on multiple distress lists, it's a higher probability that you have a motivated seller. And it's also a higher probability that they will sell to you at a discount. Now, whether or not you use Excel or you use some of the other uh, data aggregating sources, the websites that I'm going to give to you later in the video, that's up to you, but it still can be done. But that's what list stacking is in a nutshell. Uh, direct mail is very popular for wholesalers because they're generally a very high volume business. Sometimes they'll have teams, acquisitions teams, dispositions teams, the acquisitions people need high volume of leads they have to keep them busy so large volumes of inbound marketing direct mail seo ppc that's common with the wholesalers and they're usually the ones that send out you know 10 20 30 thousand pieces a month um, i that's not my business model um, i'm more i'm a flipper rehabber i do a little bit of wholesaling and i'm buy and hold rental um, the advantage is what i like to use direct mail for is targeting my buy box also if you are a long-term buy and hold renter, what I like to do is use direct mail to target my ideal customer profile for my long-term rentals, which usually means houses that are anywhere from 1,100 square feet to 1,500 square feet, box ranches, built after ideally 1980. I love the ones built in the 90s and the early 2000s. They make great rentals as long as the roof and the HVAC is good. I don't have to worry about issues with cast iron and plumbing and outdated electrical panels. I really love buying those houses. So I like to pull lists based on this ideal buy box criteria. So that's an advantage of using direct mail to buy and hold houses. Also for your short-term rental, uh, your Airbnb guys, if you like uh, mountain properties, lake properties, beach properties, you can pull lists. You can get these lists and pull uh, properties that actually fit that criteria that work very well for short-term rentals. So you can use that in conjunction with your direct mail strategy, which can be very powerful. Their advantage of direct mail is your multifamily investors. There's usually this full will fall into the long-term buy and hold, but there are some people that will flip multifamily properties. The point is uh, inbound SEO paid search websites is very effective for single family houses up to about four units, but we find that the search engine traffic or the search engine volume drops four units are better. So I know I have a lot of colleagues and uh, people that like mobile home parks, they like multifamily, anywhere from 10 units to two, 300 units, commercial properties, whether or not that's retail, storage, industrial properties, this is where direct mail uh, can be very effective because the search engine volume for these big prof properties is a lot lower. So you can pull very targeted lists if you're a multifamily investor, if you like mobile home parks and that kind of, uh, that kind of investing. Um, you heard me short, talk about short-term rentals. Okay. Okay, buy box. So 
When I say buy box, I have some videos based on buy box. But when I say buy box, I know that I'm looking for houses that are, have an after repaired value of anywhere between about 130,000 about 250,000. I would like houses built for flips after 1960, for rentals is generally after 1980, 1990, up to about 2010. Um, I like 1,100 to 1,500 square feet. Um, three bedrooms, two baths. That's, I'm a little more flexible with my flips than I am with my rentals. So for example, I flipped houses that are 2,000, 2,500 square feet, but I generally prefer stuff under 2,000 square feet. The point is, I'm probably, the, when I pull a list of properties, when I'm doing my buy box, I'm going three bedrooms, two baths, 1960 to about 2010, ARV from 150 to 250. Um, the other data points that I can compile are how long have they owned the house? So I can exclude people that just bought their house this year, last year, year before. So anywhere, at least they've had they've had to have had owned the house for at least three to five years. So five years, up to forty years of ownership, um, and then what you have is distress signals, which could be bankruptcy, divorce, vacant house, out of state owner. Um, liens, judgment, that varies by state and county. So uh, what type of data you're able to compile does depend on where that data is being pulled from. Um, other distress signals can be um, anybody that, let's say, tax default. So there's a tax lien on the property. So what you do is you combine the buy box, your purchase criteria, with these motivation signals, and then you're able to build a list of, you can build lists of properties anywhere from two, a couple hundred to a hundred thousand. I like to stick with lists of about three to five, three thousand, around three thousand. So, so where can you go to get lists? When we talk about these lists, there are companies. List Source is one. They compile lists, um, another called Batch Leads. For the most part, these companies are only going to sell lists. So list of properties, they also sell consumer lists, but with list source and batch leads, you can get lists of properties based on purchase criteria and motivation signals. On top of the list, uh, the, the list, list companies, there are list brokers that you can use that actually have connections with the list companies. I've used them before. I haven't had really good success with them, um, but the list brokers are out there. They can be good with getting very specialized lists. If you're, for example, if you're a short-term rental person and you want a very specific type of list for a very specific type of property and you're not finding it on list source, then you might go to a list broker. Um, I don't know of any list brokers that I can recommend at this time, but they are out there. Um, another example of a great website that's very specialized is if you love probate leads and you like sending direct mail to probate leads, you can go to alltheleads.com or probateleads.com and several other services. And what they do is a national company, what they do is they train and hire people to go to all the 1,200 counties in the United States do the probate research, and then they upload all the, all the files into centralized database. So you don't have to go spend a bunch of time at the courthouse if you don't want to. You can subscribe to the service, um, have all those leads uploaded into a centralized database, and then you can do your direct mail, your cold calling, whatever you want to do. But those websites are available if you really like probate leads. Thing is, you have there's certain research tools. Um, PropStream is one. PropStream is more or less a data aggregator. I wouldn't consider it a uh, CRM, but I like PropStream. I can pull lists, I can send emails. Um, I can also send direct mail directly through the PropStream dashboard. You can also use PropStream to, to pull comparables if you want. REI SIFT, that's another, it's a data aggregating tool. REI SIFT is actually very complex. Um, you can just go to reisift.com. There's ex videos on how, how the tool works, but basically if you have large lists, of properties and you need to go through and sift through that data. Uh, REI SIFT is really a, an enterprise, I would call it an enterprise level tool. It's, it's pretty sophisticated. There's gonna be a lot of uh, t time and effort that you have to spend into actually learning what this tool does. But if you really like data and you like digging down and getting very specific and parsing out the data, REI SIFT is a great tool. Um, RE Simply is another tool that you can use that's similar to those. Also, you have CRMs that will have uh, tie-ins where you can pull lists of data, send out direct mail all through the CRM. You have RealSoft, you have REI Blackbook. Uh, RealFlow is one. I've used RealFlow in the past. Um, it's, it's dedicated to real estate investors. Uh, Connected Investors is another platform. If you're gonna go directly through a CRM, I would recommend staying with a CRM that specializes to real estate investors, uh, but there's hundreds of CRMs out there. I have a thing called an all-in-one service. Sometimes they call them mailhouses. 
I haven't had good experience with them. I know there's a, another great YouTube channel by Ryan Dossie. He has um, ballpointmarketing.com. He does the actual um, mail house. I don't know if he pulls a list, but he has uh, the different types of mail pieces that you can use, um, videos on how to do it. Uh, he's actually a prop stream user. You can go to ballpointmarketing.com. It's another great resource. Um, now there's another level, there's actual services that may not like, uh, they may not pull lists for you, but they have all these templated uh, mail pieces, postcards and letters dedicated to real estate investors. So open letter marketing, I've used them in the past. Uh, ballpoint marketing is another one. The, uh, also yellowletters.com, Yellow Letters HQ, they specialize in the yellow letters, but there's all these different uh, websites where you can actually pull templates of direct mail pieces. Now, rather than go and invent the wheel and try and customize your own letter, I did that in the past. I wouldn't recommend doing that again because it's, it's just so time consuming, but there's all these websites that I just gave to you. You can go there and you can use these templates and at least there is some data behind it on how effective each of, the, each of these templates are. So you have your yellow letters, your postcards, your fake checks um, that goes into the actual piece, but there's all these tools that you can use to help your direct mail campaign. Peace media, all right, so when we're dealing with peace, when we say peace, we mean what are you sending? So are you sending postcards like these? You're sending letters? Uh, you're sending, the other big thing right now is fake checks. So it looks like a check. It does have a very high conversion rate. I've used the fake checks in the past. Um, they get, now, the last campaign I did when I used fake checks, I got double the calls that I got from when I sent them postcards. So uh, everything I hear from my colleagues in the industry say that the fake checks are crushing it right now. That's probably gonna stop sooner or later. It's gonna get saturated, but right now, Fake checks are very effective. It's between postcards and letters. Generally speaking, letters will have a higher conversion rate. You'll get more leads, calls, and web form submissions from letters than you will from postcards. Um, fake checks, you will generally get more uh, calls, web form submissions from the fake checks. Why not just use fake checks instead of postcards? Well. Here's the thing, you have to take your budget into consideration. If you use postcards, you can send more pieces to more people for the same price. So you have to balance how wide of a buy box or how wide of a list you wanna cast. Uh, but if you want a very highly targeted list of a few hundred, I would probably stick with a combination of the fake checks and the customized letters. Um, now, anything that looks like handwriting will have a higher open rate and a higher conversion rate. You can use companies like Open Letter Marketing and Ballpoint Marketing to send out letters that are handwritten, but they're written by a machine. They're written by a robot. Now, you're gonna be looking at a little bit more than a dollar a piece to send those out, but they will have a higher conversion rate. The people that I know, the big wholesalers, that let's say they do 20,000, 30,000 pieces a month, from what they tell me, they use a combination of postcards, fake checks, yellow letters, um, and they mix it up. They're always testing, they're always researching. Now, interestingly enough, what they've been telling me is that conversion rates on direct mail have been declining over the years, and I think this is uh, because uh, search engine marketing is becoming so popular. Um, but a lot of them will use a combination of the pieces that I just told you about. So I like to use the postcards or letters to advertise my website. So my website is always on my direct mail pieces. Sometimes you get these, um, these type of postcards where it says, oh, I, and there's a heart on it, I would love to buy your house. You get mixed results with those. What I like to do is use direct mail to target areas where I, or, I have already bought a house and leverage the fact that I bought houses in the area and just tell them that in the letter or in the direct mail piece, whether it's a postcard or what have you. Okay, if you're gonna send out postcards, my advice is don't go with the real small postcards because they, their conversion rate on those are so low, it's not worth sending them. I would stick with the large or the jumbo cards. I would go full color. Um, you can go, depend. now the more cards you send out, the cheaper they'll be, but I wouldn't go too cheap on the piece. Um, so I would go full, full color, two sides, use the larger or the jumbo sides for best results. Bounces, when we say bounce rate, what we say is when we send pieces out, there's going to be a certain amount of that bounce back. And really what that means is it says, undeliverable as addressed, return to sender. There's gonna be a, an amount that comes back, whether it's two, 3% or whether it's 10%, whether it's 20%, it depends on the list. It depends on how accurate the list is, where you got it from. Um, 
I've had, if you have a very high bounce rate, let's say you send out a thousand letters and 200 of them bounce back, that usually means that the list that was pulled did not have very accurate data or it was outdated. So you heard me mention skip tracing before. What skip tracing does is basically hire somebody or a company, and a lot of times it's artificial intelligence that's doing this for you, and they research these records, these property records and the owners, and come up with all the known addresses, all the known phone numbers, and all the known email addresses. So let me give you an example. Whenever I skip trace something, I always put myself on the list. And what do I see? I see the house that I grew up in, the original phone numbers. First phone number I ever had was 356-6458. You want to call that number? You're not going to get me. There's uh, other phone numbers, other landlines that I had when I lived in that house. And then since then, I've lived in apartments and I've bought and uh, been an owner-occupant in, in a few single family houses, not too many. Some of them might wore my house hacks. <laughs> the point is, is that you're going to get email addresses that I don't use anymore, like AOL. You're going to get phone numbers that don't uh, direct you to me anymore. So a lot of times with these uh, skip trace data, you have to go through the data and see what's most relevant. And this is what I find very tedious. Um, the advantage is when you do some skip tracing, they should be a last known. Uh, so this number, the last known use of this number is like 2013 or 2020 or whatever it is. Um, so you can actually use that to actually delineate and see which data is the most fresh, the most recent. Um, so, you know, that's what you have to deal with with bounces. Um, the actual strategy, there's not very a right, right versus wrong. It really depends on what your budget is, how aggressive you are, what your risk tolerance is. Um, I've found that direct mail is very common against the more traditionally minded uh, long-term buy and hold investors. Some of the rehabbers, direct mail, I use it to supplement my digital campaigns, but it's not my primary means of generating leads. And that's partly because one, with all these data points and all these points that I have to manage, I find that tedious. It's just not my favorite, and I find that the conversion rate has been steadily declining uh, year over year. Some people rave about it, say it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I'm just telling you my experience. The budget that you're going to use or the strategy that you're going to use for direct mail is really uh, dictated by what is it that you want to accomplish. You know, are you a wholesaler, rehabber, uh, short-term real estate investor, all that. Okay, frequency. Generally speaking, there's, there's a few different ways to do it. You can do a one-off campaign where you just send a batch of letters or postcards out to people um, that is frowned upon. They say that you know you might as well pick a budget and then do it consistently every month, quarter after quarter, year after year. I've done both. Sometime I've done one-off campaigns and I bought one or two houses and a lot of times I've done one-off campaigns and not get anything. I did do a campaign with a turnkey direct mail provider where we did I think it was four months, and what I noticed that the call volume and the lead volume gradually declined. So the people that I talk to that do direct mail consistently, a lot of times they'll use, uh, they'll manage the campaigns themselves, and let's say they'll have 3,000 pieces a month that go out, but they will gradually whittle out or edit down the list to take out ones that are not responsive and always adding new ones in. Um, yeah, it's, it's better to be consistent over time. Um, now I can say, even though my direct mail has not been the most consistent, I've always been consistent with the search engines and, you know, I don't just do PPC for one month and stop it. I do PPC every month, uh, per quarter, per year. And if they're, when I look back at all my inbound leads and I analyze the campaign, there are times when I have to get rid of the campaign manager because the campaign is just not performing, but that doesn't mean I shut off the channel. It just means that I get rid of the manager. So keep that in mind. I'm a big advocate of always, always tracking your marketing, whether that's in call rail, call porter, uh, some of these inbound, uh, call strategies uh, that log all your calls and record the conversations. Um, I always keep a spreadsheet of all leads that came in, what the address was, the date that they came in, what the status is, whether or not they closed, because at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, I want to see where are my leads coming from, where are my deals coming from. Okay, budget. Um, from the people in the industry, uh, the consensus is that they are closing, it usually takes about 2,500 to 3,000 pieces to get a deal. That is the consensus I get from some of the bigger wholesalers. Now I've done 1,000, uh, I've done one campaigns of 1,000 pieces and gotten deals from it, and then I've done campaigns of 1,000 pieces and gotten nothing. So the 3,000 seems to be reasonable. Um, direct mail budget, obviously 3,000 pieces a month is going to cost you about $3,000 a month, roughly. Um, 
you can get that down to maybe 2,500 if you're using postcards and you're using the same provider every month, but that's probably what you're looking at. You can always batch them into small batches, highly targeted lists of let's say 250 pieces a week or every other week, and you can continue to do that until you find something. But with marketing, there's no guarantee you're gonna get a deal. That's the thing about marketing. There's no guarantee you're ever gonna get a deal. So you're risking some money and you need to be aware of that. Okay, sales process, very important, speed to lead. When a lead comes in from direct mail, if you don't contact that lead right away, you're wasting your money. Don't wait three and four days. I used to work with a lot of buy and hold investors. Leads would come in, it would take them a week to call them. Those days are over. Uh, you ideally you want to answer the call live. If it's not you, it's somebody else. There are services that will answer calls live for you based on a script that you approve. Uh, if they leave a web form submission, you want to get back to them in about a minute. This is a very competitive industry. The days of taking three and four days to call back a leader over. Speed to lead is very important. As far as DIY or outsourcing, if direct mail is good if you have a uh, if you don't have too much budget, so it's an opportunity to do it yourself. I've used uh, turnkey mail houses and I didn't have good results from them, so I can't recommend any uh, turnkey systems, but I like to use direct mail to supplement my search engine campaigns and also mine areas uh, for leads where I bought houses and especially houses where I really like uh, the type of house that's in the area. I really like the area. So I like to use my direct mail campaign in those areas and I like to keep track of everything with a tool. I choose to use PropStream, but you can use whatever you want. And I like one tool where I can do everything inside of one platform just to keep things organized. So like this channel, subscribe. There's going to be more content coming out. Leave your questions in the comments. Remember, I can't help you if I don't know who you are. I can't help you if I don't know what you need help with. So stay tuned. There's going to be more videos coming.